Thanks to the current high rate of crime and advanced modern technology at the disposal of police and other law enforcement agencies, a massive amount of cases are now solved each year. But many of these agencies are left frustrated at the amount of cold cases that will seemingly never reach a satisfactory conclusion. Number 5. On the 21st of September, 1978, 73-year-old Nan Dixon from Grass Valley, California, traveled 180 miles to seven troughs near Lovelock, Nevada to collect $6,000 owed to her by her brother, Harry Layton. But she never made it to their rendezvous point, and despite extensive searches, she was never found or heard from again. Three months later, Nan's husband noticed a charge of $4.18 on his debit card at a gas station in Lovelock. Police searched the area but found no trace of her. Her car would eventually be found years later by coyote hunters in an area that police had extensively searched before. They found tire marks leading to the spot, indicating that it had been driven there recently, and two pieces of duct tape one of which contained possible human tissue and a strand of hair attached to it. They also found what appeared to be blood on one of the tires and in the trunk. In the car, they found four packs of cigarettes in a brand different to the one that she usually smoked, and a partial note which read, quote, keeps telling me to use my gun and end my nightmare, but this I'll never do, for God gives life, only God can take life. Committing suicide is unpardonable, and I will never be. Nothing more was ever discovered to explain Miss Dixon's disappearance. Number 4 Ken McElroy was one of 16 children, and by the time he was 15, he was known as a cattle rustler and a small-time thief. He was later indicted 21 times but would always get off scot-free as witnesses were too intimidated to testify against him since he would follow them around or park outside their houses to watch them. In 1980, one of McElroy's 10 children was accused by a store clerk, Evelyn Summy, of stealing candy from a store owned by 70-year-old Ernest Bowencamp. McElroy began to stalk the Bowencamp family and on one occasion entered the store to threaten Ernest with a shotgun. A confrontation ensued and McElroy shot Ernest in the neck, though he would survive the attack. McElroy was charged with attempted murder but convicted only of assault and was released on bail. Shortly afterward, he went to the D&G Tavern with a rifle where he loudly described what he was going to do to Ernest. On a later occasion, while McElroy was in the bar again, Townspeople decided to confront him and swamped the tavern. He decided to leave after buying six beers for the road, but he was gunned down while sitting in his truck. Though there were 46 witnesses, including his wife, no one identified the shooter or called for an ambulance, and his killer remains unknown. Number 3 In 1947, 22-year-old Christina McCone lived in Ontario where she was employed at a local bank. She was in a relationship with 26-year-old John Ray Kettlewell, whom she'd known for three years. The couple were good friends with Ronald Barry, a 28-year-old Italian immigrant and professional ballroom dancer. In May of the same year, John and Christina decided to get married, but her family were against it as they had concerns over their relationship. Christina's sister, Helen, felt that the three spent too much time together and she suspected Ronald may be in love with Christina. The couple decided to elope and spent the first three days of their honeymoon at an apartment in Tyndall Avenue along with Ronald before traveling to Ronald's cottage in Severn Falls, which was only accessible by boat. After arriving at the cottage, Christina started to behave strangely seemingly dazed at times before going into crying fits. 
During this time, she had conversations with Ronald about whether or not John really loved her. On the 20th of May, Christina disappeared from the cottage, and when Ronald returned there, he found that it was on fire with John sitting inside, disoriented and with a head injury. He managed to pull his friend from the burning building and immediately started looking for Christina. He realized she wasn't in the cottage and could only watch as it burned to the ground in just under an hour. He loaded John onto the boat and traveled back to Severn Falls, where he drove him to a hospital and contacted police. That evening, Neville Sweet, the owner of the boathouse near the cottage, found Christina's body in just 9 inches of water, 150 feet away from the cottage. She had no burn marks from the fire and didn't seem to have undergone any trauma at all. Her autopsy revealed that she had codeine in her stomach, but the cause of death was ultimately declared as drowning. Major Lawrence Scardafield, who had tried to put out the fire earlier, stated that he'd seen no signs of a body when he was fetching water while fighting the fire earlier. Jack claimed that he couldn't remember anything that had happened after 11 a.m., and both men were interrogated, but nothing came of it. At an inquest into her death, a jury decided that there wasn't enough evidence of foul play, and although the two men's relationship seemed to be more than they let on, Christina's demise remains a mystery. Number 2 In 1977, 39-year-old Charles Morgan was an escrow agent at Statewide Escrow in Tucson, Arizona. He and his wife Ruth had four daughters, and they seemed to have a normal, unassuming life. On the 22nd of March, he drove two of his daughters to school and seemed to vanish off the face of the earth. When he didn't return home that evening, Ruth became concerned and she reported him missing. Nothing was heard from him for the next three days, but at 2 a.m. on the fourth day, she woke to the sound of someone banging on their door. When she opened to see who it was, she found Morgan standing there, dazed. One of his shoes was missing and he had a plastic handcuff around his ankle, with another pair around his wrists. She tried to talk to him, but with a gesture to his throat, he indicated that he couldn't talk. She gave him a piece of paper on which he wrote down that he'd been kidnapped and his throat had been sprayed with a hallucinogenic drug that would cause him to go insane if he spoke or swallowed. She begged him to go to the hospital, but he refused, saying that, quote, they would kill him and his entire family if he did. While she took care of him over the next few days, he told her that he'd been working for, quote, them for about three years and that they had taken away his treasury identification. He also revealed that he'd been working for the federal government against organized crime, but the less she knew, the better. From this point on, he became paranoid and wore a bulletproof vest at all times. He would later reveal that he was due to testify against two mafia bosses in a case involving real estate fraud, and that if anything were to happen to him, he would leave a letter behind explaining everything. He then promptly vanished again, this time for good. His promised letter was never found and the case grew cold until Ruth received a call from a woman who called herself Green Eyes and she said, quote, Chuck is all right, Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8. His body would be found in a wasteland 40 miles from his home with a gunshot wound to the back of his head. He was wearing his bulletproof vest and had with him a handgun, a hunting knife, and ammunition. As his gun had been fired, it was assumed that he had committed suicide, but gunpowder residue was found on his non-dominant left hand. Police found one of his teeth wrapped in a cloth on the car's back seat. They also found a hand-drawn map and a $2 note clipped to the inside of his underwear along with a pair of glasses which belonged to someone else on the front seat. On the bill, seven Spanish names were written along with the words Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 8. On the back of the note were the names of people who had signed the Declaration of Independence, numbered 1 through 7, and a map leading to Robles Junction. The woman named Green Eyes would later call police to tell them that Chuck had driven to the desert to pay a hitman who'd been hired to kill him. But the hitman ended Chuck's life and fled with the money. 
his killer was never identified. Number 1 On the 2nd of January, 1935, a man who gave his name as Roland T. Owen booked into room 1046 at the Hotel President in Kansas City, Missouri. He would later be identified as Artemis Ogletree from Florida who'd left his family in Birmingham, Alabama to hitchhike to California. At the hotel, he asked to be put in a room several stories up and staff described him as being well-dressed in a dark coat, but he didn't have any luggage with him. He paid for a one-night stay and was escorted by a bellhop to his room where he produced him a pocket comb, a hairbrush, and toothpaste. After handing over the room key and returning to the lobby, the bellhop saw Ogletree leave the hotel. A short time later, one of the hotel maids named Mary Soptic went to clean room 1046 as there had been a woman staying there the previous night. To her surprise, she found Ogletree inside but he told her that she could clean the room while he was there. Throughout his stay, staff noticed that he always had the curtains drawn with one dim lamp lit, causing them to believe that he was either hiding or afraid. When she cleaned, he decided to leave and asked that the room be kept unlocked as he was expecting friends in a few minutes. She returned to the room at 4 p.m. and saw him lying on the bed, fully dressed with the letter on the bedside table that read, quote, Don, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Wait. When she went back to the room the following morning, the door was locked from outside, and when she opened it, Ogletree was inside on the same spot as the previous day. He'd received a phone call in which he said, No, Don, I don't want to eat. I'm not hungry. At 4 p.m., she took fresh towels to the room, but was told through the door by another man that they didn't need any. On January 4th, the hotel phone operator noticed that room 1046's phone was off the hook. A bellboy was sent to investigate, but there was no answer at the door. At 8.30 a.m., another bellboy was sent to use his passkey to enter the room. He noticed Ogletree lying undressed on the bed and he placed the phone back on the hook before leaving. Two hours later, the phone was off the hook again and the bellboy returned to the room. He found Ogletree kneeling on the floor and saw that the room was covered in blood. He found that Ogletree had been strangled, beaten, and stabbed but was still alive. Police asked who'd done this to him, but he stated that he was alone and passed out. He would later pass away in the hospital. His murderer was never found. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.